This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. A colleague of mine has referred a patient for further management. This is a patient who has undergone surgery very recently and the primary surgeon has diagnosed that the lens is decentered on the first post-op day and the patient has poor vision and the primary surgeon has suspected that there was a posterior capsule tear with possible vitreous disturbance and uh, there is a reason why the lens couldn't be centered well. There is also a mild vitreous hemorrhage which had seeped into the sclerocorneal tunnel which was done. The surgeon also was suspecting a possible posterior polar cataract in this patient. The patient did have a mature uh, cataract. Because the posterior capsule tear happened uh, without any significant reason, the primary surgeon also suspecting a posterior polar cataract in this patient. The one feature which was very striking was the horizontal white to white diameter in this patient was very large. So that was a very striking feature. Although when we looked at the IOL power which was implanted, it was about 22 diopters. The biometry of course looked like it was an average eye, but the horizontal white to white diameter was significantly bigger in this patient. So the patient had very poor vision. The next post-op day and uh, the primary surgeon referred for further management. Uh, we did a B scan. B scan did not show much of any vitreous debris and this is the view in the operating microscope. Here is my plan to handle this case. My first goal is to ensure that go ahead and clear all the uh, vitreous which is there by doing antivitrectomy. Try to retain the excess margin and if a significant amount of anti-capsule support is there, uh, try to fix the same lens inside. So this was my game plan for this case. So I'm injecting 2 ml of lignocaine in the inferior medial quadrant as uh, to provide posterior subtenous anesthesia. So uh, let us have a look at the case first. When I turn on the retroillumination, the background red glow, I can clearly see that uh, this is the area where the posterior capsule is deficient and these wrinkles are in the posterior capsule which is intact. I can see the rexus margin very well in the superior quadrant. However, in the inferior quadrant, I am unable to trace out the rexus margin as such. My plan is to use just two side ports to manage this case. I am not going to use the original sclerocorneal tunnel or the original side port. I am going to make fresh two side ports. To begin with, I am going to inject OVD into the eye. This is HPMC which is being injected into the interchamber. The first thing which I want to do is to track down where the inferior happening is going. I feel that it is gone under the posterior capsule tear and it is in the antivitreous. So using a Sinsky hook, I just maneuver the haptic out of the capsular bag that is from behind the posterior capsule tear up and above the anterior capsule. And then the lens is rotated gently so that the haptic is resting over the anterior capsule. So first I'm just trying to safeguard the lens from dropping down into the vitreous. So I'm using two Sinsky to just retract the iris and trace out the extent of the posterior capsule tear and whether am I able to visualize the edge of the rexus margin. Well, the PC tear has gone on to the equator. There is no distinctly visible rexus margin as such. So now we have both the haptics in the sulcus above the rexus and now is the time to deal with the vitreous. I'm going to use diluted transonacetate to stain and identify the prolapsed vitreous. My left hand has the irrigation cannula with a low bottle height of about 40 centimeters. I go in with my cutter with a high cut rate of 4000 cuts per minute and a low flow rate in vacuum and gradually the antivitrectomy is begun. The prolapsed vitreous along with the vitreous hemorrhage and few of the lens fibers were all taken care of swiftly. The visual axis is clear, there is no posterior capsule edge which is coming into the visual axis. Both the haptics are in the horizontal meridian. It looks to be quite well settled but the moment the chamber fluctuates I see the lens rotating. And this happens because the haptic of the lens is 12.5 mm and as I mentioned earlier, the horizontal white to white diameter in this patient was significantly bigger. So I'm not certain what to do at this stage. And because the rexus is eccentric and large, I can't achieve an optic capture. 
So we can understand the value of having a properly sized axis in such situations because once we get an optic capture, the lens will be locked in place for life. But that is not possible in this case currently. Now, after giving a thought, I thought that the horizontal white to white diameter is significantly much more than the vertical one. But however, I have the post capacitor running down in the 6 o'clock region. But I am still hopeful that there is insufficient anti capsule support to try to rotate the lens and ensure that the haptics are then oriented in the opposite quadrant that is 90 degrees away. So I'm just trying to do that. And I just wait for a couple of minutes and luckily for me, uh, the lens looks to be stable. It's not moving around and because the vertical white to white is definitely much more shorter than the horizontal white to white, I thought this 12.5 millimeter original lens could settle in well here. The only disadvantage was the rexis in that area is slightly larger. It's the only disadvantage which I have. But in this situation, I thought that was the best possible thing to do. And of course, if the lens still decentered, I think then is my plan to go ahead and exchange the lens and then try to find a bigger lens and then place. So that was my thought process. A diluted pilocarpin is used to constrict the pupil. That's how the case is done. Thankfully, the patient did well. The lens continues to remain in position, although it is not perfectly centered, but in an undilated pupil, it uh, seems to be holding well. Anyway, I'm just keeping a close watch in the event of any subsequent decentration. Obviously, we don't have a choice but to exchange the lens and consider other modes of fixing. Either a bigger lens if it's available or fix an iris-supported or a scale-supported lens. So that was it. Thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.